Realizing that time that I would physically train, whether it was some time in a gym or bouldering or sport climbing, that would reduce the pressure. Like it would feel prepared and capable. Power. Power. This time to build. What's up, everybody? I am your host, Chris Hampton. Welcome to the Power Company Podcast, brought to you by PowerCompanyClimbing.com. Today, we've got part one of a really interesting two-parter. Our guest is Josie McKee, who is founder and coach at Mind Athlete. She's been climbing for over 20 years, worked on Yosar for three years, has climbed El Cap over 20 times and holds speed records in Yosemite, the Sierra, the Winds, and Patagonia. So she's a capable climber. Josie is based here in Lander and was training for a trip to Yosemite by limestone sport climbing, which personally I think is really smart. But having been a tratty myself is something that I know a lot of climbers will not at all understand especially the young traddies who believe that trad climbing is so much different than sport climbing. So initially, that's what I wanted to discuss here. And we do. We discuss how she prepared, how she thought it would go. And then after her trip, we come back and we talk about how it actually went. But we went deeper. Josie's history with Yosemite and the walls there is complicated. So there were some big things wrapped up in this trip. The most interesting to me, and one that most of us will wrestle with at some point, is our identity as climbers. This is part one, part two, next week. Let's get into it. I kind of want to just jump into this because... Last night, you and I both spoke at a storytelling event, the Hulahan Narratives. Um, we were talking on the theme of origin story. And there were a couple of things from your, your story, as well as the intro that Amy gave for you, that I assume was something you provided. Is that right? I did, yeah. That got my wheels turning a little bit in terms of what we were going to be talking about today. And I I think it was just an interesting exercise in talking through origin stories and history and, and how history can, can change what comes out of it based on the context it's used in, Mm -hmm. you know, like I said last night, it can be used to inspire. It can also be used to hold people down or hold back progress. Um, when we mythologize it too much. Um, And in Amy introducing you, she said that you had moved on from spending all of your time in the mountains and on big objectives because you didn't feel like it was helping you grow as a climber anymore. Mm -hmm. And you switched into essentially sport climbing in Lander, Wyoming in order to prepare for those big objectives. And that sort of flies in the face of what a lot of people think is the way, you know? Just the other day, Chris Caloose posted on Facebook, what if all this time sport climbing has been the best training for crack climbing? And I'm like, yeah, you mean other than bouldering? Of course it is. (laughs) But I don't think a lot of people believe that. So I'd love to talk through what you're going through right now. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, the the story that you just brought up, the concept of me like pushing bigger and bigger things over and over again, it was basically a point where I was climbing the next big thing or – trying to do it faster almost every time I went rock climbing. Yeah. And it bred this just chronic anxiety because I think I wasn't strong enough for it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was 
because it was anxiety around performance pressure um, more than actually fear of getting injured, although that was in there as well. Sure. Um, but I, I wanted to do things that I probably wasn't capable of. I was just pushing myself too hard and realizing that these little windows of time that I would physically train, whether it was some time in a gym or bouldering or sport climbing, that would reduce the pressure that I would put mm. on myself. Like it would feel prepared and capable. And um, in the midst of some of that really hard time in my rock climbing when I was really pushing, uh, I realized that I was challenged with this anxiety that would just come up. It was it was probably worst when I was hanging out on a belay ledge. It wasn't bad when I was climbing, but right, it was like right. thinking about climbing and decided I needed to do something about it, started working with a mindset coach, and she asked me during one of our conversations, Josie, what's the most fun rock climbing that you could imagine doing? And I was like, oh, limestone sport climbing for sure. Like, I love climbing on granite, but it's also just a lot more fun to be able to try harder moves and to not worry about the pressure of getting to the top of some wall or sending each pitch on a wall because mm -hmm. um, it's just like it accumulates all the different steps of the process. Um, and so being able to just enjoy the movement, go up, come back down, you can try harder and so you get stronger in the process. Yeah. Yeah, you can try harder partly because you've reduced a lot of that anxiety that's built up, not only from the pressure of having to best your time or do something bigger or do the next obvious objective, but but also because you're not 3,000 feet off the ground. You know, there's not a complicated system that you're dealing with. You've reduced a lot of the chaos around it um, so you can focus more on the movement. Mm -hmm. exactly. where, I, where I think a lot of people can't make the leap, and I'm, I'm just curious your thoughts here before we dig in more into the, the mindset of it all, where a lot of people can't make the leap is the movement can be pretty different from limestone sport climbing to granite crack climbing. Um, and people can't see the carry over there. What were your thoughts around that? Well, I would say that to a certain point, you need to develop your crack climbing skills and know yeah. how to jam all the different sizes mm -hmm. if you're just talking about pure crack climbing. But really, pure crack climbing... There's very few pitches of like hard pure crack climbing, especially on granite. Yeah. Um, and so once you've mastered those skills, you've reached a certain point and then at a level, I would just just to throw a number out there so people have a perspective, somewhere in the 512 range, I think the blend of being able to competently move on any type of rock is going to carry over to like the crimps, the pockets, the throwing heel hooks, as well as jamming, they all kind of are going to lend themselves to any style that you're on. And, I mean, people make fun of me for – well, make fun of, but I think are also um, inspired a little bit when they watch me climb some of the stuff around here where I'm jamming – on limestone. Yeah, of course. And it makes it easier. Yeah. But the, they tease me in like, Josie, there's a jug right there. Why are you jamming? And I'm like, well, a hand jam is a jug. Yeah. Like more so than a jug is a jug, especially if the majority of the climbing that you're doing on that pitch is jugs, you'd rather relax and use a different position. Yeah. Um, the other thing, the pocket climbing is so similar to particularly climbing on pin scars which is a lot of the, the harder pitches in Yosemite. Yep. Um, they were seam cracks, and then they got blown out as people hammered pens into them. Yeah, they're like, essentially manufactured pockets. Totally. You know? <laughs> so Wild Iris is great training for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And, you know, what occurred to me when I heard that last night is, like, you had gotten to a level on 
big objectives, trad objectives, mountain objectives, um, where your skills were long, but going and doing more hard sport climbing adds breadth or depth Mm -hmm. to your skills that's pretty hard to get on big wall climbing or, you know, big, scarier objectives. Um, And I think that's what a lot of people are missing. It's not just the 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 movement it's not the technical aspect of heel hooking or of doing a drop knee or something when you're sport climbing or when you're bouldering there are so many more opportunities to make a decision from a much wider set of variables Mm -hmm. Um, when you're jamming you're just like okay what's the next size i need to jam on this next move and then this one and then this one and then this one and their you know crack climbing skills are really pretty simple in comparison to bouldering skills sport climbing skills and i'm separating those but really they're not separate you know you're using all of these skills that you're learning and the things like decision making and using momentum and all of these bigger principles of of climbing well, you get to practice far more often while sport climbing yeah. um, than you do just doing another granite crack in a slightly different size than the last one you did. Yeah. And even when you're, you're trad climbing, especially on bigger objectives, even if you're not on pure crack, right? there's so many other variables in the mix that are time consuming. I mean, Mm -hmm. just the aspect of placing gear is time consuming. Yeah. And so you aren't utilizing that time to learn new moves. Right. And so to progress as a climber in the, in the pure movement as a climber and being able to intuitively trust your movement, you have to explore a variety of different rock types and types of climbing and then try harder moves a lot. And you're not going to spend time trying harder moves a lot when right. you're dealing with all these other variables. Totally. We we watch something like the Don Wall where, you know, Tommy and Kevin are trying this sideways dyno over and over and over. That's the, that's like the 0.001% of big wall climbing. Yeah. You know, is trying the hard move over and over. <laughs> it's so much more construction work and labor beyond that. Yeah. I'm I'm curious when you moved into sport climbing as a way to pre- and you're using it now as a way to prepare and we'll get into that in a little bit but how did you avoid that same I or did you avoid that same I have to do the next hardest thing the next biggest thing um the next obvious objective it's almost set up more to draw you into chasing, like chasing grades. the next grade. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think I think part of it is because I'm not actually that strong of a rock climber. Like chasing the next grade for me is not checking any big box that anybody mm. cares about. Like I've done a handful of 513s like It's not anything to write home about, you know? Yeah. Um, So I think there's some element of the, like, social pressure is off, whereas sure, climbing where I had gotten into with climbing in Yosemite was setting some speed records and, like, doing Mm. these things that were, I mean, it it was an ego thing. And you were getting that, that ego was being built up because of, Partially because of outside pressures as well. I think well. so, yeah. You felt like people were watching. Yeah. That's really interesting. I think... It's hard for me to admit that right now. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, that's a that's a real thing. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's smart to admit that. And it makes the switch to sport climbing make a little more sense. Because a lot of people will go toward trad and be able to soak in more of the adventure aspect of it. And there's less pressure because now all of a sudden for people switching from sport to trad, the grades are way lower for them. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm a 512 sport climber. 
oh, I'm a five nine trad climber, mm-hmm. you know. So the like the pressure isn't as much. It can be more about the adventure. But for you, the trad side was more pressure because of your status in that world. Yeah, I think a little bit. I think I realized that. So for a number of years, I was taking the winters off of climbing and going surfing. And I'm like, not really that good of a surfer. Like mm-hmm. if you put it on a scale for climbers that are listening to this, like I'm, I'm like maybe a 5'9 or 5'10 surfer. Like yeah. I could surf, but like I'm not shredding out there. Yeah. I'm not surfing big waves um, and I'm having fun with it. And that's kind of how I feel a little bit about sport climbing is like, I'm not trying to do the best of anything. I'm just trying to get better and trying to enjoy the time that I spend out doing it. Mm-hmm. And that break from climbing into that surfing taught me that, that uh, to do something that I'm bad at, I think. Yeah. How did it teach you that? Um, I think what was easier for me with surfing is that it's, so much more individual like you don't need a partner to go do it and I would just stay out in the water trying to get better at something some element of my surfing and where I I was spending all this time in Baja surfing there's a small group of people that were there for a month or two in the winter and you got to know all these people and a few of the guys started kind of taking me under their wing, like coaching Mm -hmm. me a little bit. They'd be sitting on the beach watching and I'd come in and they'd tell me something, some piece of advice. And like one of the things that I remember specifically was just nail your takeoff every time because you don't get anything else on the wave if you blow your takeoff. Right. And so, I mean, it seems obvious, but hearing somebody articulate it that way, I was like, okay, That's what I need to work on. I just need to, every single wave, I need to make the takeoff. And Mm -hmm. then I can do whatever else I want on the wave. And being able to find those little bits of, I'm going to focus on learning this, Mm. I think took the pressure off um, of of trying to perform in some way. And I think I've transferred that to climbing where I don't, I mean – Every climber cares about the the red point, the sand, sure. right? But yeah. I've spent a lot more time thinking about what I learn on e- or what I want to learn, what I want to get out of each attempt on something. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. I think that's why a lot of people would be able to drop the ego moving from sport into trad is because they are essentially becoming a beginner again. You know, and that's what you were doing with surfing. And I fell out of love with trad climbing myself for really two reasons. And one of those was that I felt like I had sort of run out of growth potential just chasing harder crack climbs. Mm -hmm. Um, The other is that a lot of the trad climbers of that era when I was trad climbing were very adamant that track climbing was harder than sport climbing. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, no, it's not. It's really simple in comparison. Mm-hmm. You know, I go into the gym and these dudes are doing, you know, incredibly complicated things. And then I go out here and I do the same jam for 60 feet, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a, a, a gross simplification of all of it, you know. But those are the reasons I fell out of love with it. And it it's it's warms my cold little heart to see <laughs> people like you, people like Brittany, um, all sorts of really good crack climbers who are really good in the mountains, also embracing sport climbing and bouldering and these other aspects. And we've seen it for years where you know, the Ethan Pringles or the Sunny Trotters who are really good sport climbers can just go get on a hard crack and do the damn thing, Mm -hmm. you know? So it surprised me for a lot of years that we weren't seeing more people do the crossover thing. Were you, like, did you see any of that going on and think about that? Or was this purely a, 
this is not a healthy place for me. I'm just performing constantly and I want to learn. So you moved away from it. Um, I don't know what the Valley scene is like, so I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I, both of those things come into play as well as just wanting to be somewhere different. Um, I knew that I'm not a very like strong and powerful rock climber and I wanted to see what I was capable of if I developed that skill set. So yes, like go sport climbing, train, see what that's going to do um, because I've plateaued with my physical capability. Like mm -hmm. probably for a decade of climbing like the same grade. Basically having not red pointed anything harder than I'd on sighted which just shows that there was a lot to develop there. Yeah. Um, That's exactly how I was when I was a drag climber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't having fun anymore. I was dreading going rock climbing for probably a year or so. Or I had gotten to the point where it was just like, I love rock climbing. I know I do, but. I can't find that anymore. Yeah. And so doing something different with it, something that I could love again. Is, I don't know the timeline of this, so will this be your like first real foray back into whatever your objectives are in the Valley after having spent a lot of time as a sport climber? Yeah. Definitely. Um, I went last year, but I had also, I hadn't been training for very long last year before I went. I had had ankle surgery about six mm. months before the trip to Yosemite. And that makes crack climbing tough. Yeah. <laughs> well, and actually the, the crack climbing wasn't that bad. My ankle was healed to that point where it was like okay in cracks. Um, but I was still really scared to fall on sure. low angle stuff. Yep. And so I couldn't step into my like try hard zone mm -hmm. at all on that trip. Um, so it was fun to go back and I definitely noticed that even, so I started climbing again after my ankle surgery in August of last year and then went, um, to Yosemite in the beginning of October. So it was, it was two months about of climbing again at all after four months off of climbing. Um, and I trained pretty hard and got there. And I noticed that I was stronger than I had been mm. um, on certain things that I was climbing. But my head wasn't in it. Sure. Um, so it was – it did work. And I think um, now going back after a solid year of training and – feeling like my ankle's solid and feeling really psyched about the progress that I've made as a climber. Yeah. I think this is going to be the first time that I can like really apply that cool. new set of skills. Are you willing to talk objectives? Like, mm. well, you, you, you don't, you don't have to, you can, you totally feel free to say no. I'm, I'm just curious. Um, we can be broad and dance around the actual thing. Yeah. I, so Partially because I don't really know how I'm going to feel when I get there. Yeah. Um, I have some ideas in my mind, but really I just kind of want to go warm up on some things that I've done before, see how it feels, mm -hmm. see how partners come together. Um, because climbing something big, I found like you could go do it with whoever's capable of it, but... I don't really want to spend that much time with somebody that's just capable of it. I want to spend that time with somebody that I really enjoy sure. the dynamic with. Well, tell me this, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> is, the, is the potential objective, will it fall in line with harder or faster or bigger than what you <laughs> used to do? Um, I'm, Which direction are we trending? I would say that what I'm trying to do is see how much harder, like, Got it. physical grades that I can, and not necessarily, like, checking a number box, but, like, can I send some harder free climbs okay. um, is kind of the general objective, yeah. Perfect. And when you 
you go to Yosemite, you realize you're stronger, you come back here, you're sport climbing. What does that look like for the year? Are you purely just trying to climb harder sport? Are you also training in the gym? Um, I want to get this stuff out of the way before we dive into the how are you dealing with the the pressure and the mental side of it. Mm -hmm. um, but what does the training look like? I'm curious. Um, so for the last few months leading up to now, it, well, August-ish. So we're in the end of September or close to the end of September. I don't know what day it is. Mid-September. <laughs> Mid-September <maybe. laughs> somewhere. <laughs> um, so for a while, um, I was focused. I was sport climbing, uh, bouldering in the gym, lifting, doing, you know, a couple of training sessions in the gym. Um, per week, and the focus was really on getting more, getting stronger, more powerful, um, projecting things at that kind of second tier was mm -hmm. something that uh, I've been training with Alex Bridgewater and something that we had talked about a bit. Um, yeah. Because I think that that makes you a better climber, and it's also really important to have the skill of being able to red point things quickly if you're going to try to red point things on walls. Yeah. Um, and it's something that, again, like I said, I hadn't really red pointed harder than I'd on sighted until a few years ago. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I would say I'm not that great of a red point climber. I'm getting there. Um, but that was a, a skill set that I wanted to work on, um, as well as I think that that space of trying things that are under your limit and trying to send them faster is probably the best space to develop your skill set as a raw, like, to get better at movement, to get um, more trusting of your intuitive movement on mm -hmm. hard moves. Um, yeah, it allows you the space. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you don't have the chaos of a uh, limit movement for long periods and things that are really, really hard that take all of your focus. Instead, you can work on the tactics. You can work on the the mindset of doing something quickly when you don't have it totally dialed in. Um, it's such an important space mm -hmm. for climbers. Yeah. And maybe not given enough credit by mm -hmm. a lot of folks. You know? People don't like to do that because it's stressful on the ego to to not send something like first yeah. go, second go when it's it's not that big grade. It's not your limit grade. Yeah. Um, but again, it goes back to just having that kind of beginner's mindset about it. And just, okay, I'm going to try to do this thing and see if I can do it in three tries or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a smart place to be. Um, and one reason for that is I've encountered a lot of really experienced rock climbers who really don't know red point tactics very well because they've spent a lot of time either in their on-site zone or below that. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't need to, or they've like mega projected and, mm -hmm. you know, spent 70 days on something, but never like five days on a thing, mm -hmm. you know, and and the tactics are wildly different for each, you know, length of project. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really important place to go, especially if you have the kind of objectives that you do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been one of the focuses. And then transitioning this last six weeks or so before going on the trip has been uh, more endurance focused. Um, so doing a lot of like up and down climbing and laps on things that are pretty easy climbs mm -hmm. just so that. I know that my body can withstand movement for, you know, a thousand, couple thousand feet in yeah. over like a half day or a full day of climbing. You mentioned to me last night that you're going to go to Vitavu for a few days. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, a like brush up on my granite skills type of a, a, a climbing trip or... Yeah. This is something totally separate. Uh, well, part of it is I'm going down there to do a photo shoot, um, but it's also I I said yes to this because I figured it would be a good time to spend on granite and remember how to put gear in the rock because I haven't been doing that much lately. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that each time I've spent time away from trad climbing, 
the thing that I'll wind up with is I don't always put the right piece in the crack first go. Sure. Like sometimes it's the second <clears throat> piece that I pull off my harness instead mm-hmm. of like, oh, I I know the size and put it in and go. Um, and it usually takes me, I don't know, three or four days of trad climbing again to remember how to do it. Um, and so this will be a good intro to that. And um, I have my mindset on something that I got on last year also that I'm kind of curious how it's going to feel. Mm. Um, I do love me some Vitavu. Even though I'm not in love with trad climbing anymore, I still love Vitavu. It's cool. It's a beautiful spot. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because you lived in that area for a bit, right? Well, I just spent like two weeks every summer there for, oh, okay. for like 12 years. Um, I just loved it. Yeah. So I'm a little jealous. <laughs> Okay, so you, you're spending all this time sport climbing. You're going to brush up on just some basic trad skills right before you go. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think or are you concerned about how those same old pressures and self-imposed um, – requirements that you put on yourself to be a certain person when you're there? Are you worried about those popping back up? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely a possibility that those will pop up. And I think I've spent a lot more time being able to focus on that aspect of my climbing and being able to articulate it as this having a mentality of, both enjoying the movement on the rock and learning something when I go rock climbing. Like those are the main goals and trying not to attach some like clipping the chain, sending the pitch as my success because there's so many variables that can interfere with that being successful. Um, one One of the concepts that someone told me a while back that has really resonated with me is Um, to broaden your definition of success and Mm. narrow your definition of failure. And then you're so much more likely to succeed, Mm. to find success in whatever objective you're doing. Um, And so I think I've spent a lot of time paying attention to what that means for me, Um, both in my climbing my projects here, sport climbing, as well as visualizing what it's going to be like when I get to Yosemite and what, that broader definition of success looks like for me now. Yeah. I I like the, the narrow your definition of failure part of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've always been a fan of widening your definition of success, but I had never thought about narrowing failure. Um, Can we talk through that a little bit? Just this, this concept of not only having clipping the chains or topping out as being success because I think this is a tough place for a lot of climbers to parse things out. Mm -hmm. Like we, we do engage in a sport that is very, you know, goal oriented, success oriented. You clip the chains, you top the boulder, you send the route, you win the competition, whatever it is, you know, um, you know, we even have rules around was it successful or not? You mm-hmm. know, did you get both hands there? Did you clip both chains? You know, there's all these rules swirling around. So it's really hard to get out of that as your definition of success. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious what other definitions you're finding and how are you holding on to those? So I think the biggest thing to focus on that I've come back to time and time again is remembering why I rock climb. And I think it, it takes a lot of introspection to be able to determine that and it's different for each person, but I love the movement. I love doing something that's like, oh, that felt improbable and Mm -hmm. like figuring out how to move my body in that way. And that space of trying hard focusing on this hard move and whether you fall or execute it, that narrow focus of 
I mean, kind of getting into the flow state. Um, and so those are success when, when I know that that's the value that I hold in rock climbing, like those are the things, those are the reasons why I rock climb. Those are what I'm searching for when I go climbing. It's not about sending, although, I mean, sometimes for sure, it, like, yeah, I want to send, <laughs> don't get me wrong there, yeah. um, but being able to find that feeling in my climbing, being able to enjoy the movement and to get in that space of really focused try hard is like, that's, if I can get that, and then if I can learn something from that, att- like say on a red point attempt, if I can get into that space and then I can also, if I fell, which would be the quote unquote definition of failing, mm-hmm. if I can say, this is why I fell, what can I do next time? And then try again and be able to focus a little bit more. Usually it's the reason why I fell. I wasn't focused enough. Yeah. I, I didn't know the beta or I was distracted by something. There's so many reasons why you're not focused, but... um there's something there if I can define what it is and grow from that and apply it on the next go. I think that's the the general way of maintaining that wider definition of success. And Yeah, and I think that apply it on the next go is a really important piece of that. Mm-hmm. Um, one way that I've been able to stay motivated and frankly – happy when I fall off of rock climbs. Like I get excited when I fall in a place where I didn't expect to fall Mm. because I'm like, oh, there's something else to learn here that I wasn't aware of, you know. This feels like an opportunity now. One of the ways that I'm able to remain in that space is by setting an intention each time I pull on. Mm Mm-hmm. And I've improved my my language, um, whether it's self-talk or talking out loud to my partner, around that intention uh, over many years, um, where it used to be, you know, I'm going to do it this try. Mm-hmm. You know, now it's, I'm going to try harder this time, mm-hmm. you know, or, you know, my effort is going to look like this this time. Um, there are still times when I'm like, Oh, I'm just I'm just doing it this try. Like I, you know, but because that's not what I'm wrapped up in, if I don't actually do it, it doesn't bum me out. Yeah. It, it just results in the question, all right, why didn't I do what I thought I was going to do? You know, yeah. what happened here? What else do I have to learn? And I I just think it's such a valuable tool to set that intention ask yourself questions after and use those questions to set the intention for the next try. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of times, I mean, because climbing is such a social sport, it's really easy to get distracted by somebody else being like, you're going to do this, this go, or, or just some conversation as you're tying in and getting ready to go up on the pitch. And especially when it's something that, means a lot and demands a lot of focus for me. Yeah. It's pretty important for me to have a moment of sitting and just being quiet and remembering the things that I'm going to focus on, remembering my intentions for that pitch and just getting into that space before I go. Right. And I think a lot of a lot of us don't do that, but it should be like it, I sh- I don't like to say should. I don't want to put all this on anybody else, but like <laughs> for me it's it goes hand in hand with the like checking my knot before I leave the ground. Mm, Check mm -hmm. my knot and then check in on like, am I in the right space within my head and within my body? Yeah, and I've talked about it on this podcast a lot of times, but for, you know, new listeners who might be here, I love the habit of talking to my partner. I do it as a way to hold myself accountable. Okay, here's here's what this try is going to look like for me. Mm -hmm. Here's Here's my goal. Here's what I want you to hold me to. You know, I'm I'm not going to say take it that bolt. I'm not going to grab the draw before I clip. You know, here's what I'm going to do this time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that helps me hold myself accountable. And and I like to do it as the belayer too. If I know my partner's open to it, uh, I'll always ask. Mm-hmm. All right, what's what's the goal this time? You know, and 
And depending on the partner, I will help mold their language over time as well. You mm-hmm. know, if it's a, oh, I'm going to, you know, this is my model of success. I'm like, let, let's back that up into something we can control. You know, how about your, your model of success for this go be you're going to attempt to do that. You know, you're going to put this effort in where you bailed last time, something like that. And then asking, if, like, if your partner wants you to remind them while yeah, they're climbing. Totally. Like, like you weren't going to clip from that position. You were going to do a couple more moves further, like keep going. Mm-hmm. Or remember to try hard right there. Remember to do the drop, knee, whatever the thing is that they're supposed to focus on. Yeah. Sometimes it's helpful to have that partner remind you. And yep. having those conversations, like, oh my gosh, climbing's so special for that reason, that mm-hmm. you can have that partnership that, like, not only are they tied to the rope with you and in charge of your safety, your life is in their hands, but um, they can coach you through things. Yeah, it's like this, you know, co-learning. Mm-hmm. It's like, can I help you while you're up there? Mm-hmm. you know, somehow. And and what does that look like for you? For some people, it looks like just shutting the hell up, yeah. you know, <laughs> and being quiet. And for some people, there needs to be little reminders. Some people love encouragement, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, you're right. It is really special for that reason. Are there things you do outside of climbing to cultivate this, whether it's journaling or just reflection or are there some sort of tangible things you do to make sure you're going to be in the right mindset as you leave for Yosemite? Yeah. Um, visualization practice, um, which is, I really wish there was a better word than (laughs) visualization because it's not about, The vision piece, it's about, right. it's like, it's a multi-sensory uh, imagination experience, mm-hmm. I think, is it is how I would define it. And it's, I usually do like a meditation practice and then within that am envisioning what, not only what it's going to look like to execute the beta, um, of a certain rock line, like a a red point that I'm working on, but um, mostly what it feels like, how I want to feel in my body. Yeah. Um, And then there's the little bits of the internal dialogue too, the, you know, trying to tell myself that I'm capable, um, little affirmation kind of things Mm -hmm. is really useful. Um, One of my favorites that has, really helped me and I think is the thing that bridges the gap between sport climbing and drag climbing for me is this I trust myself mantra um, and what that feels like in my body to trust myself, Mm. to know that I know how to move on the rock and I know how to do all of the things. And when I spend time every day envisioning what it's like to move in a way that I trust myself, I can take that and when I'm standing at the base of a route, remember that feeling again. Or when I'm at a rest stance before a crux, I can remember what that feeling is again. Mm-hmm. And it's easier to focus when you trust yourself. You just let go of the doubts and you can just try hard. Yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm curious, is that something that you were able to pull in from outside life or is it something that began in climbing? And if so, are you able to carry it outside of climbing to other things? Um, you, you work on a lot of things. You're, you're building a business right now. Um, you've worked with the wild, wild climbers for quite some time. You've, um, ran the festival here. So there are lots of other things that I think require that trust in yourself. And I'm I'm curious, did it come from life or are you carrying it into life? I think it probably more came from climbing and I'm taking it into life, but then there's like, it goes back and forth. Like sure. the more I learn how to trust myself in life and business, the more that I can feel that 
sense of trust in my climbing. I just get stronger in both ways. Um, but yeah, I think climbing was how I learned to articulate it and to really define mm-hmm. what that is for me. And then, yeah, I think that going into work, like creating this business that I'm working on, um, there's so many unknowns. Yeah. And being able to say like, okay, I know what the next step is and not get overwhelmed and just I trust myself to take this next step. Um, that's the – that's how I've applied it to life. And then also like last night getting up in front of a crowd and speaking. Like mm-hmm. I, I love doing it and I've done it tons of times, but it's still anxiety-inducing yeah. right before you're about to get up on stage in front of a crowd. Yeah. Like um, am I going to just – blow this like forget everything that I was supposed to say no like I trust myself and I know that feeling and it just it brings me back into the present moment and focusing on what I'm doing yeah very cool I'm also curious about you you mentioned something and we sort of glossed over it that I think is a really important thing that experienced climbers are I won't say always good at but but I see it in experienced climbers a lot that I don't see in newer climbers as often. And that's the ability to know how you're going to feel up there, um, whatever that is, um, whether it's you're going to feel fear or you're going to feel doubts or there's going to be some other anxiety or whatever it is when you're trying to accomplish a thing, you know, a red point, a rock climb. Being able to stand on the ground and say, or to lay in bed and, you know, imagine what this scenario is going to be like and be able to recognize, okay, at this point, I'm going to be scared. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I'm going to doubt that I can do that move. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to try it anyway. I'm going to recognize that that fear is there and I'm going to do it anyway. It's such an important thing to be able to do because I hear newer climbers very often say, I don't want to be scared up there. You know, mm-hmm. I just have to not be scared. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the wrong approach. Yeah, absolutely. Because we can't really control our emotions. We can just control our response to those emotions right. and let them pass. And I think that, I mean, fear is this it's this thing with rock climbing, right? Like all of us have experienced it at some totally. point. Yeah. Um, I think. I mean, maybe there's some outliers out there like Alex Honnold. Like an Alex Honnold, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but being so when I first was starting to articulate this concept, um, it was going out in the mountains and like it, this, it, this was on a trip in Patagonia, which there's so many things to be afraid of in Patagonia. Like, yeah. It's really dangerous down there. Loose rock, ice that can fall on you or, you know, you can fall into a crevasse. There's really bad weather that can hit pretty quickly. All of these variables that you can't really control and then the little amount that you can. And I started feeling this overwhelming dread every time I was going to go in the mountains. And I spent a lot of time meditating down there and visualizing down there, partially because you're hanging out in town waiting out weather all the time um, and just getting ready, like waiting, checking the weather report. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have that time. And naming the enemy was what I started Mm. calling this concept of like, okay, what is it that I'm actually worried about? And kind of what it came down to was that there's so many things down there that if I could compartmentalize each one of them, it was a lot less overwhelming than just this like, oh my gosh, there's so much. I'm just scared. I'm terrified of going out in the mountains. Like, okay, these are the things that I'm worried about. Like the weather being, because I got caught in a pretty bad storm up on Fitzroy and I think that traumatized me for subsequent adventures. Um, to recognize that, like, that was the thing that I was worried about and to control as much of that as I can and to know what I can do about it. Um, 
if weather starts coming in, like this is how I'm going to make these decisions. And, and just knowing how to address those things when they come up means that they don't have to take hold of you and just you, like you don't have to sit with the fear. You don't have to be in the fear constantly. Yeah. Um, but if you're, if you're not accustomed to recognizing it and being able to label what it is that you're afraid of or worried about or distracted by, it's just going to be a distraction that's making you feel not capable or not good in some way, shape, or form, and you're not going to be able to perform that with that thing in the back of your mind. Yeah. Bring it to the forefront. You're like, I'm afraid of, like, for example, this is something that I think a lot of people have been on. Like, not as many people have been up in Patagonia climbing and, like, dealt with those real dangers. But right. I think most people probably get kind of scared when you're trying to do a hard move a little bit above your protection. Sure. And you're not willing to commit to the moves because it's a hard move above your protection. And then you think okay, I'm scared. I'm scared for this reason because I might fall because this move is hard enough that I might fall. And being able to look down and assess the actual hazard of falling. You're like, okay, this fall is something that I'm comfortable with. Like it's, I'm probably not going to hurt myself on this fall. Now I can execute the move. Or maybe I need to take a little bit of a smaller fall and feel what that's like and and know it and understand it. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, like as you, we've, I kind of went on a big loop around here from your question, but um, more experienced climbers do this more than less experienced climbers. And I think the more experience you have, the more you can just look at the hazard and assess it and say, okay, this is something I'm willing to accept or not. Versus as you're building your experience with climbing, you haven't checked all those boxes like you don't know what every fall is going to be like you don't know yet that your gear is going to hold or your belayer is going to catch you or all these things and so it's hard to articulate yes or no i'm yeah. willing to commit to this movement yeah you have to build a process to get through all of these things and the the more experienced climbers in a lot of cases have honed in their process mm -hmm. over many, many, many times doing this, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there are a lot of times I've heard relatively new climbers saying, well, you know, this climber just doesn't get scared up there. And I'm like, that, you're full of shit. Mm -hmm. like, they, they absolutely do, you know. If I'm trying a new sport climb, I get scared above the bolt, you know, until I know what the moves are. The unknown of whether I'm going to fall or not still scares me a little bit, mm -hmm. you know? I still get scared on boulders that really aren't very tall when I don't know what the move, next move is going to be like, you know? Yeah. I just have a process that I've built up to work through those things, whereas a new climber might not, and they get stuck at the same point over and over and over, and it takes a long time to find their way through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And something you just said, I, I think sort of highlights the beauty of using sport climbing as a way to prepare for these bigger objectives because on these bigger objectives, there's a lot more to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And that fear is going to complicate your process. Nobody starts with the most complicated process. You know, we, we start small and we build up into it. So if you're at this big complicated process where there are all these variables swirling around all the time, it's really hard to recognize that there's a new problem you haven't dealt with before and then find your way through it. Mm -hmm. So stepping back down, so to speak, um, into sport climbing where it's much easier to say, okay, there's a bolt this far away. That there's a pretty high likelihood that bolt's going to hold mm -hmm. if I fall. I can practice this fall right here mm -hmm. and I can strip that fear away that way you know it's easier to work your way through that process um, I think that's an element that's missed all the time in how sport climbing can be a great uh, build up to harder track climbing yeah definitely and and then you add in the variable of if your gear is going to hold yeah. which 
I I don't spend a lot of time climbing on gear that I don't think is going to hold. Like not totally. I, I don't want to place gear if I'm not sure about it. Yeah. Or if I'm not sure about it, I'm going to place like three pieces in a small section and mm-hmm. make sure it's going to hold me. Um, not that you can do that every time, but I like to know. I don't like to take whippers and pull gear. I've done that very few times. I don't actually, I can't think of a time that I've taken a fall and pulled a piece of gear right now off the top of my head. Um, I can only think of one time I've ever, that's not true, two times I've ever pulled gear on a fall. And one of the times it was because the rock broke. The other time it was a piece of gear someone else had placed and I just clipped it blindly. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. And you can you can become a pretty damn good trad climber without ever having to place bad gear. Yeah. Uh, there's – maybe unless you live in North Carolina. <laughs> 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 maybe then you're going to have a hard time always having good gear. Yeah. No shade at North Carolina. They might just might be behind the times ethically a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um. Do you think, I mean, I know what the answer is here, but I'm curious to hear it. Do you think all of this preparation is going to be effective and where do you think the holes might be that you need to shore up a little once you get there? Um, I think that getting back to the place of feeling comfortable on a big piece of rock mm. um, is probably going to be the hole because I can't really feel that here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can go out in the winds and do some things, um, but that's different. It's it's not like a wall in Yosemite. Um, so I think just getting used to that, like being up there with the exposure, with the like trying to get back to a comfortable place while at a hanging belay where I'm like not dreading the next pitch or worrying about my performance on whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, That kind of stuff is stuff that's harder to train for, I think. Um, And so just getting back to comfortable with that, the commitment level basically. Mm. Um, But I think that... Again, it goes back to being able to recognize what the things are that go into the process. And so commitment is one of those things that I just mentioned. I've learned to recognize where that's something that's distracting me, that's like sucking my energy, that like, oh, gosh, we have to get to the top of this thing. Um, We don't have to get to the top of it. Like, as long as you label that that's the thing that you're concerned about and you're like, oh, well, we we can always go down if we need to. Or I have the skills to go up quickly, aid climbing. Like, yep. I can do that. Like, I don't have to send this go. Mm-hmm. And so being present with where I'm at in that process in that day and, again, defining what the success is. Like, what is it that I'm trying to get out of this attempt and this – this day up here on a big route. It's the same as what you're trying to do on a single pitch. It's just bigger, but it's not any different. Yeah, just multiplied over and over however many times it is. Yeah. You know. Well, I think it's a super smart approach. Um, I'm really curious to hear how it goes. Um, I... I love when I prepare for an objective, I go to the objective and there's something that I didn't prepare for because I wasn't expecting that that if I had really thought about it, I'd have known that was there and I just took it for granted that I'd be able to do that, you know. I sort of love those moments when mm-hmm. I show up unprepared, having prepared for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious if any of that sort of thing pops up for you. And what that might be. Um, But before we wrap this up with the hopes of, 
you know, talking again after you are back from Yosemite. I, I want to know what of this sort of preparation that you've been doing and this mindset work that you've done, are you seeing uh, with other climbers, whether it's clients you're working with or just people you've talked to, where are you seeing this, this sort of thing show up for other climbers? I think that, so mindset stuff, I think the simple way to break it down is into the two categories of like performance anxiety versus the fear of falling because you're scared of getting hurt or dying mm -hmm. from a fall. Mm -hmm. um, and so I see those things with people. Um, and I think on the performance side of things, the biggest thing that I think people deal with that I've had conversations with multiple people about and then I, I see it out at the crag is people just getting frustrated with themselves. Mm. Like they throw wobblers when they fall and or they, they come down and start making excuses. And it's it's all about the ego. It's just getting wrapped up in did they perform on that go? And if they didn't, it's frustrating to them. And gosh, it seems like climbing is way less fun if you're doing that to yourself all the time because climbing is mostly failure if you are if you look at it in the, like, spectrum of clipping the chains versus not. Like, mm -hmm. most of the time you're not sending. And if yeah. you are sending most of the time, you're probably not trying hard enough. <laughs> totally. Um, and so I think applying that concept again going back to like what success and failure are and and being able to know what it is that you love about rock climbing and and trying to find that every time you're going rock climbing is the thing that has helped me the most and the people that I've worked with the most like they stop beating themselves up so much and start having yeah. fun again what if you just end up like me and you're like oh, I'm going to go back and do these trad objectives. And then you get there and you're like, nah, I'd rather go sport climbing because it was so much more fun than this. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, oh, bouldering's even more fun. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> it's fall right now, right? Like mm -hmm. we're just starting to get like really nice weather and everybody's talking about this or that that they're going to do. I mean, wolf point season around here or people are talking about going to the red. And mm -hmm. fall's good everywhere. The red's really fun. I've never been. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> and I, I can't go anywhere in the fall except for Yosemite because I've been like, that's just what I do. And part of it is because I love going there sure. and fall there is beautiful. And part of it is the community. And I know that like all of these people that I know and don't get to see very often, I'm going to get to see there in the fall. Um, and so that's going to be fun. But at the same time, I'm like, I wonder if I go test what this sport climbing training has done for me for my Yosemite climbing this fall, will I be able to take a fall off? Like, can I mm. – can I go do what I need to do with it this year and then retire from it for a little while? Not necessarily like quit doing it, but mm -hmm. can I go and see how hard of a sport climber I can be? Can I go explore these other places that I've never been and and really test my limits in a place that's just more fun and, and there's not all these variables? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> do you think your identity is wrapped up in – the bigger stuff in Yosemite? Um, I think it is, and I've started to care less and less about that. Mm. Um, I don't know. I think it, it's going to be really interesting to see how I feel going back there again because it's been a while since I've performed in Yosemite, since I've like really tried to do anything with myself there. And so I wonder, like, do I care less about it because I haven't been doing it? Right. Or do I care less about it because I just care less about it now? Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I love these kinds of questions, you know, and just like the stories last night, we, you know, we all have a bunch of different origin points. Um, 
and our identities can can and should shift. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I know that sounds like a tough question when it comes out of my mouth and it sounds like a tough answer for you when you're saying it. But I think it's a thing we are grappling with every single day. Like, how is my identity shifting? Where Where is it going? Am I okay with it going there? Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's such an interesting question. And I'm excited to see what the answer is when you get back. And if it's shifted more, if you're like, nope, I'm a Yosemite climber. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe I won't come back. No, Maybe kidding. you won't come back. <laughs> Maybe you just live on the granite forever. <laughs> no, I think... I doubt that that will be the case because I do really love sport climbing. Like, it is just so much fun and it feels way more sustainable. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's talk again. Sounds good. Whenever you're back, and I hope the trip goes well. Thanks, Chris. Oh, man. I can hardly wait for you all to hear part two of this because... We uncover some things that are absolutely fundamental to having a long and fulfilling career as a climber. That'll drop a week from today. And I'm going to save my thoughts for the end of that episode. In the meantime, at the blog post for this episode, you'll find links to work with Josie at Mind Athlete and more ways to get in touch with or follow what she's doing. Power Company Podcast is brought to you by Power Company Climbing. You can learn, grow, and excel with us at powercompanyclimbing.com, where we have recently completely overhauled our website, making it easier than ever to search topically through our decade plus of articles and episodes. Check it out. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Power Company Climbing, but never the Twitters because we don't tweet. We scream like eagles. This time, 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 this time,